Yeah. All right. So we're a little early. We'll let the people come in and we'll take the seats and all that. But like I said, we, we did start recording. That way, um, I don't forget. <laughs> yeah. That's Miss Amy there, right? Hi, Miss Amy. How are you? Good morning. Good. As we take our seats, go ahead and we'll open with the word of prayer. As I did say, we did start the recording early, just so that way everybody already knows. I forgot last week, so <laughs> try not to do that. So let's go ahead and open with the word of prayer. Father, we come before you. We come before you on a very chilly morning. And Father, you know, it is nice from the break of the heat, and we appreciate uh the getting to bundle up and we appreciate the heat in the building even more, Father. And Father, we, we thank you for another opportunity to come together and to worship and serve you, Father. As we read your word, we ask that you grant us the wisdom to understand the words you've written to us, that you write your words on our hearts and that you use these readings to change our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So we're going to start the class with what I am going to title, and I've borrowed that from somebody else. There's another program that says Five Minutes in Church History. 30 seconds in the 8th century history, because there's a whole lot of context there is to be covered. So we're going to take little snippets from the 8th century, which is the time placement of Jonah, so we can get caught up on some stuff that we may or may not remember and or might be new information. So this is from 2 Kings, or 1 Kings, or 1 Kings, excuse me, I have a little thing up here telling me that we're recording, so, <laughs> and then I have all these little things. There you go. Second Kings, or first Kings chapter 11, verses 37 and 38 says, I, that is God speaking, will take you, Jeroboam, and you shall reign over whatever you desire, and you shall be king over Israel. Then it will be that if you listen to all that I command you and walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight by observing my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did, then, it's a condition, then I will be with you and build you an enduring house as I built David, and I will give Israel to you. The context for that statement, Solomon, the third king of the nation of Israel, this is still the United Kingdom, he has turned his back on God through all of his wives. That's what the Bible text tells us. God is now going to rip away the 10 northern kingdoms from Solomon. So God sends a prophet, and this is that intercourse. This is the latter part of that intercourse. Because what we're going to focus on is the simple fact is, is that through the prophet, because this is where that prophet comes, he's wearing this new garment, he rips it up into 10 pieces and gives them to Cherubon. But we remember, some of us might remember that, right? This is still during the reign of Saul. This has not happened. This is a prophetic event that is going to happen. Jeroboam, the first, all right, is the recipient of this. He is going to be the next king or the first king of the divided kingdom. Hmm. And what did God say? If you obey my commandments. And how, Big gift. How many times did God do that and was ignored? Oh, totally, 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 totally. Yeah. We're going to keep going. This is this is just thirty seconds. This is a little spot. But what did He say is going to happen? If you do this, what am I going to do for you? Yes. Create a dynasty. Create a dynasty. <laughs> Why does Jeroboam only get ten instead of the entire nation? Because God wasn't going to take David's dynasty. That's why he's only getting 10. So Jeroboam could have his heart's desire if he followed. God is going to make him an everlasting dynasty if he follows. That's our 30 seconds. We are going to advance the slide just one time. Oh, it did. So just so that way we can just be clear. I forgot the pointer. You can't see that. <clears throat> So Saul, the first king, David, the second king. David is the model king, right? So we hear David referred to all the time. That is that David we're talking about. His son, Solomon, is the one who is king at the point of this prophecy. But if you notice, after his death, there now becomes divided. 
kingdom. We have the northern kingdoms and we have the southern kingdoms. Jeroboam was to be given and was given the 10 northern tribes, all right? And as God said, if you follow my commandments like my servant David, it's all downhill for you, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to establish your kingdom. I'm going to make you an everlasting dynasty, all right? So now let's pause the ship. I'm sorry, I'm talking to myself as I do this because there's a whole lot that goes on trying to get this back to the way it needs to be. Because you're not seeing any of this, right? Yep. All right, excellent. Now we go zoom sharing, and you should see all that. All right. So we started last week. We left off looking at the fact that God does not, everything that God has done is not recorded in the Bible, right? We looked at the fact that John tells us explicitly that if everything Jesus had done and it was written down, that the world could not contain the volumes, right? That's the last verse in the book of John. We then showed another example. We went to Job. We looked at Job, and in Job, we see that Job was one very rich, all right? And he was very rich, and we pointed out the simple fact is that it never once uses gold or silver in there to identify his wealth. It was all through possessions of animals and livestock, and that helps us date the book of Job. That puts it into the patriarchal period or the period of Abraham and or before Abraham, all right? That's important for this next step because sometimes we forget and we think that the law of Moses, you don't remember when the law of Moses was given, i.e. when we have a set of rules governing sacrifices. At this point in time in history, at the writing of Job, or at the events of Job, we have no record as to what determined what a sacrifice should be, when you should do it, or anything else like that. Nothing. And yet Job says, in case my kids sinned against God, I'm going to do a sacrifice for them. So that way they'll be in the right standing with God. We jumped even backwards in time back to Cain and Abel. We were not deciding and discussing the fact of the sacrifice. It was just the simple fact that they made a sacrifice. We have no writings in the text to tell us why they would have made a sacrifice, period. Nothing says why they made a sacrifice. So not everything that is going on in the world at the time is recorded in the Bible. The Bible has a list of specific events, things that we need to know, and God wants us to know, and those are what are recorded. But there are things that are outside that are not recorded, that we don't have more information on. We don't know why it is that Job thought, hey, a sacrifice would be a good idea. We don't know why Cain and Abel thought, hey, a sacrifice would be good. We don't know why. And it just is what it is along those same lines. And by the way, that's directly relevant to Jonah. That's the only reason we're bringing it up. Go ahead. Not to get off the subject, you mentioned Cain and Abel. Yes. Um, much speculation was was made as- That is absolutely way off the subject. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> as, to regard, as regards to why Cain's sacrifice was not acceptable. Well, you don't go there, then I'm gonna stop you now. <laughs> don't read anything else besides Hebrews into the text. Okay, all I'm saying is we don't know exactly why Cain's sacrifice. Only because one was offered in faith and one wasn't, and that's what the biblical text tells us. That's what we know. The yeah. rest is supposition and speculation. Yeah, but, but that's a broad, um, I mean. That's totally, what but that's what you know. Okay. Anything else is supposition. And then because it's off topic, I don't want to keep going down that rabbit hole because we could have a whole lot of fun with it and be back in the same place. <laughs> what we know is, is that it wasn't offered in faith. One was offered in faith and one wasn't. One was accepted, one wasn't. But back to your point, the reason why we don't know is because we don't know why they were offered sacrifices to begin with. Exactly. All we know is, is that there was a reason that they did that we don't have. Same with Job. The instruction was not. Yeah, there. there was some instruction that was given. There was a reason why they would have thought that is what I should do. And that is not recorded. All right? That's the point, that it wasn't recorded. It's the same with Job, right? Job is not recorded. Why? We cannot read the law of Moses backwards in time. It was not given. There was no written established procedure that we are aware of. But we know there had to have been something because they did. Unless at that point in time in history, this is just what people did. We don't know. 
Okay, that that's problem, the point. That probably is connected with Melchizedek. We, we don't really know who Melchizedek was, but it was it was a forever kingdom. So so here's the 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 reason. All right, as Mike said on Wednesday, if you were here, he, he used a phrase I'd never heard, and I loved it. Chapter three of the Book of Opinions. So <laughs> I, I loved it, and you know, and so I had to jump on his bandwagon. Absolutely, just give him credit where it's due, and gave chapter four of the Book of Opinions. That's my chapter. So you can have chapter five, six, seven, wherever you want to be at in the Book of Opinions. <laughs> Melchizedek is not mentioned except but a few obscure places, right? We know the book of Hebrews is where he's mentioned the most. The point the book of Hebrews is making is that Christ is a priest in that same order of Melchizedek because he's not in the lineage of Aaron. That the genealogy does not matter of Christ. This is, or in regards to the law of Moses, Christ is that perfect. This is why we don't have much about Melchizedek, because if we had more about Melchizedek, we would say, well, Christ had to be more like that. And the whole point is, is Melchizedek, not that he doesn't have a beginning or an end, it's irrelevant to the story, and that's why you don't have it. He was a man who lived. And by the way, if you want to get into a whole lot of interesting writings, go look at the Jewish thought of Melchizedek, because let me tell you, there's volume for it. Right. All right? So as there is, we've talked about before, people like to fill in the blanks. You know, we talked about the prequels and the, and the movies reference last week. It's no different with anything else, all right? Anything that's obscure, that fascinates and captivates society as a whole, they draw in and try to complete the story, all right? There's supposition that's done and all that. It's one thing that's, if it's fiction. It's one thing when it's blended, because the events of the Bible happen. They're real. Those are real people, real characters, real conversations that happened. All right. Now, if you notice, I say conversations. That's because I'm trying to draw it back to where we're going. But people like to fill in the blanks. Well, there's blanks there, and we need to be cautious when we fill them in and recognize when we're filling them in. So on that point of conversations, do we have every word recorded in conversations? No. No, right? We, we know that. And here is our blatant proof of that. This is Acts chapter 2. Starting at verse 40, I hope we all remember Acts chapter 2. This is the, the giving of the tongues, the day of Pentecost. Preach, Peter preaches to the masses there at the temple, right? What did I say that was wrong? Go ahead. Nothing. I okay. was, I was <laughs> just going right with the first five words there. Yes. After they say, what must we do to be saved? And Peter says, repent and be baptized, right? And along with a whole bunch of other words. Is this the font that we can see? I just looked at that. I'm not sure. Is that small for back here? Small. That's not a problem. We can change it. If the font is small in this, please let me know because that is adjustable. Is that better? All right. It says, and with many other words, he, that is Peter, solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So in that whole discourse, there are many other words that we do not have, all right? We will see more of this in Jonah. Full conversations occurred that we get told they occurred later, but we never have them when they occur. We don't even know they occur until it says, oh, by the way, there was this conversation. All right. We need to keep this in mind as we're reading our text, all right? That there are things that, because the text says, we kind of like scratch our heads about. And whereas I know some have studied at an academic level, they understand how that gets ran with, okay? There are scholars out there that are going to say, because of these situations, that person couldn't have written or couldn't have whatever, okay? That's just not the case. The Bible clearly testifies that not every word of every conversation is written and that not everything that has been occurred is written. All right, the Bible testifies to that, and we believe the Bible, so we should be okay with it, regardless of what speculation says otherwise. Now, does anybody remember this verse? We talked about this verse. Mm -hmm. All right, so I asked who knew where the imperative was in there, but I failed to ask who knows what an imperative is. Mm -hmm. So who knows what an imperative is? Go ahead, anybody. It's a command. It's, it's, it's a grammatical word that is in the form of a command. 
Yes, it's how we define commands or how we identify commands. Remember, if you want to talk about something, you have to label it and identify it. So if I wanted to talk about a command, I'm going to talk about an imperative in the Greek language in particular. Imperatives exist out there, but we're talking about this. So in this, we talked about where is the imperative, okay? The imperative is to make, right? We talked about that. We talked about there are three other, well, there's actually two imperatives because low is also an imperative. It's commands. Listen here. Listen to what I have to say. Be old is another translation that people use to translate the word low. But both of those are the commands by Jesus. But then we have our, um, the word completely escaped. The P word, um, participle. Participle. Thank you. Our verbal adjective. See, I can come up with that one without any problem. That's what it is. It's how we are to fulfill the command. That The participles are telling us the how. They're, they modify the verb. And in this case, they're modifying to make. So it's go, baptize, and teach. Yeah, I like the way it lines up because it literally on this, the way it's looking right there, lines up. So that is the command here in this, in what we call what? Does anybody remember what we will technically call this? Great commission. Great commission, Great commission right? We are to make disciples. We're supposed to go. We're supposed to baptize and teach. That's how we are to make disciples, all right? Now I asked you, this all nations. All nations. Is that a New Testament concept? Only for Nobody answered this question. Okay. Externally. In your mind, is God, as God, only now being concerned with the rest of the world? There are people who all have their own thoughts. And I know when I asked the question last time, I saw reactions, which is why I'm telling you nobody's saying because we have conflicting thoughts in this room, and that's okay. We're going to see what the Bible has to say about it. Right? I'm not giving you opinions chapter four again. <laughs> when we need to get there, we'll get there. So we call this the Great Commission. Why do we call it that? Who is it given to? It probably and, uh, has to do with the last words being, being the last words recorded of Jesus. Okay. And, okay. And so usually people's last words are, are given extra weight or... I would say there's a lot of heavyweight in this. Yeah. Right. Who is it given to? Apostles directly, but to everybody. The disciples directly, and to us indirectly, if we want to call it that, right? It's 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 a command. We all understand. I'm not trying to lay out an argument for this. I'm assuming that we all already knew this and we're just scared to say it because, you know, I, I granted I know there are people who don't hold that view, but I think the general understanding, my understanding is this applies to all of us, right? Yes. This is a great commission, and we might say it's the great commission for the church. I don't know if you've ever heard it said that way. I have throughout the years. Mm -hmm. okay. Did the nation of Israel have a great commission? Ah, silence. Well, don't you have to answer that. The same words, uh, but they were to be a light to the nations. Well, <laughs> it, it depends on how you define Israel. You know, Israel can be the people of God. It can be... Um, you know. Absolutely right. If there, we talk in New Testament or Old Testament terms, I'm talking about Old Testament terms. I'm talking about before the incarnation of Christ. I'm talking about straight from the Exodus. All right? Exodus chapter 19. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, right? They were in slavery for that 430 years or so. Remember all of that type of stuff? These 10 plagues come and all this great stuff happens. They cross the reds, all this, right? This is three months after those, the, the, the you know, night of Passover. On that very day, they came to the wilderness of Sinai. When they set out from Raphidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness, and there Israel camped in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God. i got to get my mouse over here. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel. You have probably the first little showing there of standard Hebrew parallels, mm -hmm. right? The house of Jacob and the house of Israel, the same thing. All right, it's just, just a standard thing that we see, and you see it even more so in the Psalms. And in fact, it's actually 
anything in the Semitic languages. So if you get into anything in Hebrew <laughs> or even anything into um, the Assyrian text and all that stuff, when you get in, this is a very common form. All right, just repeating the thing. It's not saying two separate things. All right, you yourself have seen what I did to the Egyptians. Remember, this is what Moses is supposed to say to the nation. And how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among the peoples. For all, I get that little thing out of the way. For all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. Verse six, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. What were they told to do or to be, I should say? Priests. Who? All of them. All of the entire nation. The entire nation. This is what God commanded Moses to tell them. Exodus 19, verse 6. Now, many of us may not have studied this very much and don't really understand what goes on right after this. But then God tells Moses to tell the people to consecrate themselves, right? Three days, tells them how to consecrate themselves, gives them a list of things you're not supposed to do. Then they appear at the mountain, right? God comes out in mighty and force and scares the bejeebies out of everybody. Gives the Ten Commandments. The people say something very interesting after that. Does anybody remember? Said Moses and Aaron, you go talk to God. We don't want to die. You come and tell us what he has to say. Thus, we've established talking through prophets more. Because when you get into Deuteronomy and Moses is recounting this event, God said, that to frighten their eyes. I'll go ahead and talk to the prophets when I want to go talk. Now, we already know that God talks to people directly throughout. But this idea, this concept, all right, is established here. The nation of Israel said it's too scary. But right here, we are seeing that they are supposed to be a kingdom of priests. Who are they supposed to be priests to? What does a priest do? What, what's their function? At the time, it was forgiven people their sins. No, a no. priest represents the people to God. Priest represents the people to. Of course, the, your question would be, what people would they represent to God? Is the, well, my question is, what's the job of a priest, and then who are they being priest to? How is this working? What is this supposed to look like? Because we, you know, and honestly, when we want to define a term, if we're talking biblical, we should look in the Bible, and we could go through and spend a whole lot of time looking at everything the Levitical priest did, but we're not going to do that because. That would take us so far off topic, and you know, most people would fall asleep halfway through if we got that far. <laughs> Especially when we start talking about the sacrifices, not about some not good dinner time material stuff. But the reality is, is the peace, the priests were intercessors, right? They went in between a people and just using the generic term here, lowercase g God, because you had priests of other deities as well, not just Yahweh, the proper name of God. Okay. It's like they were mediators then. Mediators, yeah, the go-betweens, right? They're the ones that represented the people before God and or the God before the people. So one thing we see in terms of this in the Levitical system, all right? So sacrifices could not, were not required to be. All right, so there's multiple parts to a sacrifice. Hopefully we all know that by now. The killing of the animal and the offering of the altar are two separate things, okay? So the, the individual, and we'll read if you don't, we're going to get into this, you know, we're going to actually see this just for proving of the point. But one of the things the priest did was they're the ones who actually brought it and put it up on the altar of God, okay? They went in and ministered before God in the Holy of Holies. They're the ones who did a bunch of other things. So there was these things. There was the intermiss or intercessors between. But if you also notice, people could still go directly to God, i.e. in 1 Samuel when Hannah walks into the tabernacle and she's praying to God. Eli's back in the corner wondering if she's drunk, Right? He was the high priest at the time. He was also the judge at the time. And he wasn't, she wasn't saying her prayers to him and whatever. So, you know, there's this back and forth aspect. But, but generally speaking, 
a priest was that go-between between the people and God. So who were they supposed to be the go-betweens between? They were going to be my kingdom, that's possessive, so that would be Yahweh we're talking about, or what we will call as God, okay, big case, G, God, and who? Well, there was a, the non-Jewish people. The non-Jewish people, right? <laughs> Everybody else. Everybody else, yeah. Everybody else. That's ideal state, all right? Gentiles would be the, their word for it. At that time, it would have been Goyim. At that time, it would have been what? Goyim. Right? Nations. Peoples. Those are everybody but us. Not us as in collectively, but from the mm. Jewish perspective. And mind you, at the time, that would have been the Jewish perspective. Because Jewish, the term Jewish didn't come out until the uh, Babylonian captivity time. So you're saying yeah. they used the word nations. Yeah. They meant just everyone except us. Say. Yeah. So this word right here, nation. Oops, hold on a second. Let's pull this up. I told you we kept this up for a little bit. Let me close definitions because that's going to be. But it's this word goy. That's the 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 root is goy, and it's just people, nations, pagan brethren. So if you see right here, there's a lot of information that shows up here, and I keep this up here so that way I can easily go because. When I hover over the word, you'll see it down at the bottom, but this, this will make it a little bit bigger. But that's that's the Hebrew behind it. That's, that's what it means, and that's the lexical form of it. It's just nations, it's peoples, everybody else. That's who they were to be priests to. So when God called them out, he called them out for a purpose, they were to be a priest. Now, that does not directly equate to what the New Testament Great Commission is. There, there are several elements that are not there, Okay. We're not, we're not saying this is directly equal. We're not. What we're saying is they had a job to do when they came out. God said, here you are. This is what I want. So we're still talking about this. Is God a God for all? Okay. So we can see that from the beginning. But leave it there, but that just wouldn't be thorough. So what are some of the things they were supposed to do? So keep them and do them. This is the law. For that it is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear these statutes, the law. Surely this great nation is wise and understanding. One of the things the nation of Israel was to do was to be a witness to everybody else through their actions and through their deeds, through the giving of the law. We see that as well. In chapter 28 of Deuteronomy, it says, The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself. He swore to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord, your God, and walk in his ways, so all the peoples of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord and will be afraid of you. Oh. Um. Phil, you can see that that happened several times throughout these specific examples. When the Joshua, uh, absolutely the Jericho, they were afraid. Uh, they knew about it. it. It happens later on in Judges as well. The reference back to the Exodus time frame. So you, you've got this. You know this. This is this is repeated throughout these events. You will see them over and over and over again. Psalm chapter nine, verse eleven. It says, "Sing praise to the Lord who dwells in Zion." Declare among the peoples his deeds. These are the peoples. These are not the Israelites. These are the nations. Okay? So what could the peoples participate in under the provisions in the law? What about Passover? I'm asking these questions, but I don't expect you to answer them. Because we're going to read the text, and we'll just let the text answer the question for us. It says, but if the stranger sojourns with you... And celebrates the Passover to the Lord. So it already talks about people not being Israelites, participating in the Passover, celebrates the Passover. Let all his males be circumcised and let him come near to celebrate it. And he shall be like the native of the land. But no uncircumcised person made of it. So the non-Jew, if they're circumcised, can celebrate the Passover. If an alien or sojourn among you and observes the Passover to the Lord according to the statutes of the Passover and according to its ordinance, so shall he do. You shall have 
one statute, both for the alien and the native of the land. You're going to see this phrase, one statute, a few different times. That is not a universal blanket statement, okay? That is talking about, in particular, in context, to the Passover. So although we're going to see this several times, it's not a universal to every statute in the law applies to the alien. There's not. There are things that apply just to priests. There are things that apply just to Levites. There are things that just apply. Remember, there are 613, 613 commandments under the law, okay? There is the Ten Commandments, but there are another 603 items that are statutes that God gave to Moses and Moses commanded the people. And at the end, you see that God says, write these things down. All right, so the law was written, that is the written Torah, and I'm only giving you that because we might have to talk about the oral Torah later, which is something different. We talked about it once before in this building, but it's, it's different that it may come up. The red heifer, this is something that most of us aren't really going to understand a whole lot of, but the red heifer, the ashes of the red heifer were used to remove impurities. It was part of the ritual, the ceremony that was used for the cleansing of things like leprosy and things of that nature. But what's interesting is it says, now a man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and deposit them outside the camp in a clean place. And the congregation of the sons of Israel shall keep it as water to remove impurity and its purification from sin. The one who gathers the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. And it shall be a perpetual statute to the sons of Israel and the alien who sojourns with them, they can participate in making this and collecting the ashes of the red heifer. That's just a non-Jew. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 9 through 13, it says, So Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests. We talked about that Moses was commanded to write down the law. There's where it tells you he wrote it down. He gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and to the elders of Israel. Then Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, at the time of the remission of debts, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God, at the place where he chooses, remember that, they're appearing before the Lord of God that will come up later in Jonah. Your God, the place which he chooses, where he decides to place his name, you shall read this law in front of Israel, or in front of all of Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, the men, the women, the children, and the alien who is in your town, so that they may hear and learn and fear the Lord, your God. And be careful to observe all the words of the law. The alien, the non-Jew. I'm sorry, have I beleaguered the point enough? Because you're not even close. <laughs> How about the Sabbath, right? Sabbath is a big deal. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male or female servant, or your cattle, or your sojourner who stays with you, the non-Jew. All right, without trying to believe at this point, there are four different places where it says something to the same effect of. But we're going to get to this point here. It says, if a man takes a life of another human being, he shall surely be put to death. He takes the life of an animal, shall make it good for the life for life. If a man injures his neighbor, just as he has done, so it shall be done to him. A fracture for fracture, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Just as he injured a man, so shall it be inflicted on him. Thus, the one who kills an animal shall make it good, but the one who kills a man shall be put to death. There shall be one standard for you. It shall be a stand strength. It shall be for the stranger as well as the native, for I am the Lord your God. As I said, we're going to see this one standard. There's four different places where that grammatical phrase, one standard, shows up. It is talking about specific points. But honestly, we're running out of time, and there's 25 different places where I can show you, and that is a non exhaustive list. But there are a few key points we want to hit sacrifices. Then you shall say to them, if or any man from the house of Israel or from the aliens who sojourn among you 
whom offers a burnt offering or sacrifice that presupposes that they could, and does not bring it to the doorway of the tent of meeting to offer it to the Lord, that man shall be cut off from his people. So they could offer a sacrifice. And if they didn't do it in the right way, guess what? They were cut off. Speak to Aaron and the sons of or, and to his sons and to all the sons of Israel and say to them, any man of the house of Israel or the aliens in Israel who presents his offering, whether it is of a votive offering, a vow they made, or of the free will offering, which they present to the Lord for a burnt offering, for you to be accepted, it must be a male without defect, the cattle, the sheep, or the goats. Whatever has a defect, it shall not be offered. The point is, is they can offer sacrifices. But guess what? It had to follow the same standard. Gentiles can be considered clean or unclean. It says, when an pers any person eats an animal which dies or is torn by the beast, whether it is native, whether he is a native or an alien, he shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and remain unclean until evening. We can keep beleaguering this point, but there is one standard. Now, there are a few things I want to show as far as the idea. Jesus' words, Matthew chapter 15, it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, because you travel around on the seas and the land to make one proselyte. They traveled to find converts to Judaism. To the point, when Herod remodeled the temple, how does that show up here? You guys see this? What is that? Court of the Gentiles. You may not be able to read it. I can't make that print any bigger. But the Court of the Gentiles. Do you see the size of the Court of the Gentiles in comparison? Here's the temple and here's all the rest of the courts. Because you remember you had the, the female court and all this. But the Court of the Gentiles were for the non-Jews to go. In fact, there is a sign posted. We have the remnants of the rock that's still there that warns the, the Gentiles not to cross beyond that point of pain it's being stoned. All right, but as we're looking at this real quick, the Fortress Antonia, so when we talk about Paul and those people coming to get Paul and saving him from getting stoned in the temple, that's where they're coming from, that's where he's taken. This is Herod's temple. This is not the temple of the time of Solomon. This is after it was rebuilt during the second temple period by Nehemiah, and then Herod works on this for whatever it was, 40 years, whatever it was. What did you say, well, it took us how long to build this temple and all that. That's the building plan that we're talking about. But you see this nice big court here? That was for the Gentiles, right? Where Jesus came in to clear out, Money changers? Mm -hmm. Guess where they were? Court of the Gentiles. They were preventing the people of the nations from coming. They, they were treating the court of the Gentiles as if it was not holy. And that's the whole point. So when you go back into Jesus says, you know, you've turned my temple into a den of thieves and robbers, right? You go back into the context of Isaiah where that's given. It's talking about the people of the nations coming to God. And the system at the time prevented the nations from coming to God. Deuteronomy 17 says, God is the God. For the Lord your God is God of gods. Just so we're clear. Well, you know, I'm going to do this real quick. This is going to get really busy real quick, but I want to show you something. So we have different Hebrew words for different entities or titles, if you want to call it that, within the semantic range. But we'll translate them in the same way, right? So the Hebrew word here for Lord, L-O-R-D, is Yahweh, okay? That is the Hebrew word. We have Elohim for God. We have Elohim again for God. Lowercase g, Elohim again. Adonai, which is Lord, and Adon, well, it's just the former, all right? Lords, and El being God. You don't see that in, sometimes things are lost in translation. But what he is saying is, is Yahweh, your Elohim, is Elohim of Elohim the top, the best, Lord of Lords, the God of gods, right? That's what he's saying there. I'm going to turn that off because we're not at a point where we want to see that, I don't think. All right. Now, there are special provisions in the law that are just for the non-Jew. When you read the harvest of your land. Moreover, you shall not reap to the very corners of your field, nor gather the gleanings of your harvest, the things that fall. 
You are to leave them for who? The needy and the alien. I am the Lord your God. Oh, hey, anybody remember a story that that plays real big importance of, right? Yes. Right? This is, this is one of those fun things. People don't realize that was a provision in the law. So what that says about Boaz, because he was allowing it, and then even more, that shows more about his character. Right. Because believe it or not, they found all sorts of ways to keep from doing that. Let's just not let that to the edge of the field. Right? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I jumped ahead of myself. <laughs> Deuteronomy 14, 28, at the end. Oh, sorry. No, I didn't jump ahead of myself. I wanted to actually say what I was going to say right there. Sorry. I thought we were going to look at something different first. I should look at my own notes and know where we're going. However, so if you take this idea of the concept, right, you know how they would scatter. They would scatter their seeds, right? It's a prepared field. They dig out all the rocks. They throw them to the side, and they got this prepared field. Because they were not going to partake of the outer gleanings or the outer edges of the field, would they necessarily sojourn? Not heavily, not a whole lot. Now, let's do a little game. Let's read into the text, all right? People like to read into this particular text in a way that's really, really not fun. But this is what nobody ever thinks about. So when Jesus is giving the parable of the sower, we see this seed is scattered. You've probably heard a bad sermon where somebody has come out and said, that means you go scatter and spread the gospel everywhere. That's not what it says. Not at all. Because if you just walked out to a parking lot and started throwing seed, guess what? You know exactly what's going to happen to that seed. It's going to come and snatch it up. It's not going to take root. So now put in this principle of the edge of the field and the gleanings, right? So if they are a dedicated to God and to the Jews, they're going to sow to the edge of their field. So guess what's going to happen? Some is going to fall on the rocky soil and some is going to fall on the path. Sometimes context can add a little bit of depth to things. That is reading into it, because I don't think that was the point of what Jesus has said at all. But if you kind of want to know where it would have been, he was in a prepared field. And if you want to know how it would have fallen, because he was actually following the law out into the edge, because that person was careful. He was thinking, he knows he's not going to reap the edge of the field. It's not for him. The dedication of the temple, when Solomon built the temple, all right? Second Chronicles chapter 6, verse 32, also concerned, this is Solomon at his dedication of the temple. It says, also concerning the forms, this is Solomon speaking, who is not from your, anytime you see that, your, you're talking about God, okay? God the Father. Your people, Israel, the foreigner who is not an Israelite, when he comes from far, a far country to your great name's sake and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when they come and pray towards this house, he's talking about the temple, then hear from heaven, from your dwelling place, and do according to all that which the foreigner has called you to do, in order that all the people of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your people of Israel, that they may know that this house which I have built is called by your name. All right, so because we have very little time, we're not going to go read every one. So God hears the non-Jew as well, the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? It rose God's hearing. He knew what was going on with them, cared, and did something about it. By the way, you're going to see more about that with Nineveh, right? The blood of Abel, the land cries out. God sustains the Jews or the, the Gentiles when he did not sustain. These are Jesus' words. It says, but I say to you, or I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the day of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months when a great famine came over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath, the widow of Zarephath, in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. There were many lepers in Israel at the time of Elisha, the prophet. None of them were cleansed, but only Nathan, the Sumerian. Or Syrian, sorry, excuse me. Start playing with Sumer and you get all confused. So there's provision. Those events were set up by Jesus, but they occurred during the Old Testament. In fact, during our time frame. There's a point to all that. God has always been the God of all. The way you approach God back then had a separate set of rules. And as we saw several places, 
those rules for the way somebody was to approach God. We'll fall through the mosaic path. Now, I wish we had time to open that one up, that question, but we don't. So we're going to go ahead and close with the word of prayer. So you, Father. Father, we come before you and we say thank you, Father. We thank you for your love. We thank you that all the way back when the first sin of man happened, when they ate from that forbidden fruit, that you didn't just stop, that you continued on, that you eventually sent your son, and he died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, that we can know you and have a right standing, a right relationship with you, Father, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Philip. Yeah.